Good morning and welcome to the Deanery Garden at Canterbury Cathedral on this morning of Wednesday the 18th of August. Welcome wherever you are in the world and bring your prayers and intentions and concerns as we say our morning prayers together on this Wednesday morning. Our prayers obviously are still very much for the people of Afghanistan at this time, very much. And uh, so we keep them absolutely in our hearts and minds, but also those in grave danger still from so many fires burning across the world in different places and areas of flooding as well. Fires in the Eastern Mediterranean and across uh, the, the North Africa into Algeria and Morocco. Fires in the Western parts of the United States and Canada, the Dixie Fire in California, still not really um, under control and still burning and uh, in Algeria we've had news from Mouloud uh, from our garden congregation that in Kabylia they've had some rain but everything feels just like a desert the, the town uh, deserted but villagers helping one another and this has been a, a pulling together he says of, of the Algerian people and there's great gratitude for that so we remember all those things this morning and our mind will be filled with those images from the media and from any kind of television and front page newspaper photographs. Bring those images to our prayers because we can hold the whole world in prayer with our garden congregation this morning. Let's begin our prayers. O Lord, open our lips and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. May Christ, the true, the only light, banish all darkness from our hearts and minds. Blessed are you, creator of all. To you be praise and glory forever. As your dawn renews the face of the earth, bringing light and life to all creation, may we rejoice in this day you have made. As we wake refreshed from the depths of sleep, open our eyes to behold your presence and strengthen our hands to do your will that the world may rejoice and give you praise. Blessed be God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. Does we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. Our psalm on this 18th morning of the month is the majestic Psalm 90, which takes as its theme the rolling sweep of time. Lord, you have been our refuge from one generation to another. Before the mountains were brought forth, or the earth and the world were formed, from everlasting to everlasting you are God. You turn us back to dust and say, Turn back, O children of earth, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday, which passes like a watch in the night. You sweep them away like a dream. They fade away suddenly like the grass. In the morning it is green and flourishes, in the evening it is dried up and withered. For we consume away in your displeasure. We are afraid at your wrathful indignation. You have set our misdeeds before you and our secret sins in the light of your countenance. When you are angry, all our days are gone. Our years come to an end like a sigh. The days of our life are threescore years and ten, or, if our strength endures, even fourscore, yet the sum of them is but labour and sorrow, for they soon pass away and we are gone. Who regards the power of your wrath and your indignation like those who fear you? So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Turn again, O Lord. How long will you delay? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us with your loving kindness in the morning, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Give us gladness for the days you have afflicted us, and for the years in which you have seen in which we have seen adversity. 
show your servants your works and let your glory be over their children. May the gracious favour of the Lord our God be upon us. Prosper our handiwork. O oh, prosper the work of our hands. It's a psalm which gives us the sense of everything being a gift held in God's hands for whom time is as nothing and yet time given to humankind is a precious gift and everything is in the present tense when it speaks of God now and that is very much Jesus's habit of God in the present tense receiving the gift of this day before the mountains were brought forth, or the earth and the world were formed, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Present tense. Past tense thinking in time. Present tense when thinking of God and his gifts. And all of that becomes intensely important as we go forward and see the way in which Jesus offers the gifts of God to us in the present tense, day by day, the gift of this new day, we always say at the beginning of our morning prayers. At Matins early morning in the cathedral this morning, our Old Testament lesson was taken from the book of Proverbs and chapter 9. And as we read that first part of chapter 9 in the book of Proverbs. First of all, I was taken back to the title that T. E. Lawrence gave to his uh, autobiography. And then after that, I realised we were in a parable. And a parable just like our Lord tells, and maybe it influenced the way in which he tells them. But if we think also of, of our Lord as the eternal word, uh, in the beginning was the word. Very often wisdom, with a capital letter, is, is, is likened to that eternal word in creation. But here's the beginning of chapter 9 of Proverbs. I'm going on to Genesis, don't worry, we're only reading uh, six verses from Proverbs, but it seemed to be apt this morning. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her beasts. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her young women to call from the highest places in the town. Whoever is simple, let them turn in here. To the one who lacks sense, she says, Come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and live and walk in the way of insight. This wonderful setting of the feast and bread and wine rather like Melchizedek yesterday bread and wine being the symbol of that being invited in to the banquet not only here but of the kingdom of heaven but it's wisdom who is calling and sending out the servants and into the town and it will get a mixed response but there's a little parable which our Lord would have known and you can think instantly of parables that he tells in the same way let's um Let's though look, that was just a point of interest, uh, in parenthesis, shall we say. Uh, let's just look there at the book of Genesis and see where we're going this morning. I'm going to start in chapter 15. As I said, we won't be reading the whole of Genesis. We will connect the story, though, as it goes through, so that it's in our mind and also reflects on Old and New Testament thinking with stories from the Old Testament as well. So here's chapter 15, verses 1 to 6, and then I'll go on to the whole of chapter 16. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield, your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir, your very own son shall be your heir. 
and he brought Abraham outside and said, Look towards heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And Abraham believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. So I'm going on now to chapter 16. Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, Hagar looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abraham said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and Hagar fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? And Hagar said, I am fleeing from my mistress Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring, so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him and he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing. For she said, Truly here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore the well was called Beer Lahai Roy. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. Well, that story gives us not only the way in which the covenant which Abram was patiently waiting to be fulfilled was then something that humankind couldn't wait any long for, longer for. And Sarai suggesting to Abram that they have no son, the time is running out for them. Abram still having God's promise that your own son will be the one who carries forward everything I intended. But how hard to wait for years in patience sometimes for humankind living in time. One remembers this, the psalm again and uh, um, that psalm 90 of course is paraphrased beautifully by Isaac Watts in the hymn, O God our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. And think of those verses, time like an ever rolling stream bears all its sons away, they fly forgotten as a dream dies at the opening day. It's an impatience 
about the shortness of our time that sometimes causes us to go forward too hastily. And here's Sarai suggesting to Abraham, this is a joint decision, and it still waits many years before Abraham says, very well, let's, let's do this. And going into Hagar, and the difficulty, of course, is that the effect on Hagar is to make her proud that she is bearing Abraham's child and treat Sarai with disdain. All these human mixings of different personalities and very understandable feelings and the way in which things go forward. But it's interesting to see how the act of disobedience, very understandable disobedience, in terms of not wanting to wait any longer for God's promise to be fulfilled, and then Ishmael being born and being looked after and being given a promise that he too will be the father of a nation, but at the same time, this wasn't the promise that God intended. And so all these things are not only part of the divine moving forward in time from the one who, to whom time means nothing at all. Time is just a gift given to us in the shortness of our life in creation and the shortness of all created life. And at the same time, we think of the way in which St. Paul uses that sign. The Epistle to the Galatians, one of his earlier epistles, and in that you, re you will remember that in chapter 4, go back to it and read Galatians 4, St. Paul uses Hagar and Sarah, as he calls her, as her name will become later in the story we're reading, Hagar and Sarah as allegories. Oftentimes the stories are given that kind of meaning. And we only understand that if we go back to the Old Testament stories. That's why we are in the book of Genesis, where all beginnings are. But St. Paul brought up in, in, in that culture of his own people and now teaching that to Galatians in a completely different area and a different culture, needing to understand how the foundation stones of Jesus' own community were set in place. Yesterday at Evensong we read the story of the martyrdom of Stephen and Stephen addressing the council in the same way begins to talk about the history of Abraham and the way in which the covenant was given. That will come to us uh, in a, a great way um, later on in the Genesis story. Think of Zechariah and Elizabeth also waiting patiently and unbelieving that God can do this. And that sentence which Gabriel says to Mary about Zechariah and Elizabeth, for with God nothing will be impossible. And this is the undergirding of this whole story. Yet we go back to the way Jesus uses Abraham and Isaac and, Je and uh, Jacob, always in the present tense. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. With him time means nothing. And the gift is the gift of the new day in all its freshness. So we give thanks for these pictures of old time which translate themselves, first of all, into the mind of Jesus, sometimes as parables, as the book of Proverbs, and sometimes also as the way in which he gives us the gifts of God in the present tense, fresh each day, and points to the whole of creation as the lesson that is being given with the freshness of the new day. We see then how the mixture of God's plan and the willing obedience of the one who is being called is carried out in the middle of a mixture of human emotions, very strong human emotions. And the story of Abraham and Sarai and Hagar is a case in point. How things change and how people feel differently when the kind of happenings to them are not only uh, emotional ones, but physical ones too. How Hagar suddenly changes round in her attitude towards her mistress. How Sarai 
is filled with a different kind of feeling towards Hagar and how Abraham feels the necessity to back his wife in this and all of that has results in the way things go forward. Well there are three particular dates I wanted to mention today which are a mixture of human emotions in, in, in this way and the way in which uh, illusions going forward and imaginings which no doubt Hagar had when she felt she was carrying her master's child, all of those things can lead people in wrong directions. The, f the first date I wanted to mention is the, the, the uh, birth in 1933 of the filmmaker uh, Ronan Polanski. And I only want to mention one of his films, and that is a very famous one, Tess, based on Tess of the D'Urbervilles in Thomas Hardy. Could there ever be a more tragic story? And everything there based on Tess's imaginings fed by people around her and thinking of herself as one of the D'Urbervilles, not just Tess in her own uh, station with her, her mother and, and, and her father and all of those things which have been fed by other people's imaginings and promptings. And yet, there are kind hands around her and there are kind people around her but the way in which the relationships that she has with Angel Clare and then with, the, with um, Alec D'Urberville, all of those are almost poisoned by an expectation going forward. It, it, it's a tragic story as so many of Thomas Hardy's novels are but in this if Tess could just get rid of that sense of the illusion of being something other and receive the gift of what's there, the quality of her own life and those around her wanting to help becomes much more evident. Now that's totally simplistic in terms of how human beings are, how they behave, but it does put it in the context of realising our responsibility for one another when we're feeding uh, different emotions uh, in, into people or, or causing them to have imaginings which really lead in, in different directions and bad directions. And if I go on to another novelist, a bit like Thomas Hardy, but French this time, Honoré de Balzac, and look at his book Les Illusions Perdues, uh, Lost Illusions, the, where uh, uh, in this case it's not uh, Tess, a young girl, it's Lucien, the young man, who is Lucien Chardon, and he has uh, expectations of grandeur because he fi finds a connection there with the de Rubempre family and begins to call himself instead as he goes into the fine life and enters the salons of various great ladies, he begins to call himself by that name, Lucien de Rubempre. And the expectations cause him to be uh, difficult with friends and, and in some ways uh, uh, a treacherous towards friends who were good for him. And all the way through these books you're feeling, oh don't go there, don't go there, that's... But we are acting like gods when we're reading a novel because we have the oversight in that way. What we have with the messages of, of Jesus from the Creator is that God wills our good always. But time needs patience, even in human terms. A thousand years in your sight are as yesterday, like a watch in the night. And both those books, and Balzac of course wrote so many novels about the human condition, but Lucien is a, a good image on this morning, as with Tess, a good image, and Hagar, a good image. But the reaction of Sarai, absolutely natural, and of Abraham, all of that, but tragedy is in the middle there. And uh, that kind of patience in the middle of all this activity is a, is a hard thing to, to receive. The last uh, date I wanted to mention this morning is of the composer's birth, Salieri, who was born in 1750. Now, if uh, Salieri um, is known to you well, probably, unless you're great followers of classical music, probably you know him from that magnificent film, Amadeus, where Salieri feels himself to be but average 
compared to Mozart, who bursts onto the emperor's court like a, a, a blazing firework, lighting it up with sparkles and, and genius. And deep in his heart, the court composer Salieri knows it and feels himself to be simply average and can't accept that. And the secret hostility in the film towards Mozart becomes potent. It's uh, a film which is so strong that probably rather like Tess, uh, the uh, Polanski film of Tess becomes so strong in its imagery and certainly the use not only of the marriage of Figaro uh, where the Emperor is listening to the way in which Mozart describes things and Salieri is standing back saying to God, I've served you always and yet you give genius to this person and listen to him? Where is the faithfulness in all of that? And the puzzle of human life with regard to the will of God is something that is, has to be simply accepted for one's own call and the following of that obedience. But at the same time, the use of the Requiem in that film is so great that I, I can't hear parts of the Requiem now without those, without those images coming into mind. Such is the power of filmmakers and modern media. Uh, and uh, we become people who are, are taken in by an interpretation as well. All these things happening within a human context and giving us insight into how human beings feel with strong passions and the shortness of their time within the gifts of the Creator so that each day does become a, a new day when God's gifts are given fresh and have to be perceived, which we try to do in our reflections. I was remembering in all this uh, an old parable, and I don't know whether it's Aesop or La Fontaine or anything, but I brought out a, a basket of eggs because it reminded me of that parable of the young girl who, in being asked to take the eggs, her own eggs, to the market and thinking, I'm going to go and sell them, and then, and she's got them on her head, do you remember? as she walks along very carefully with a precious basket of eggs on her head. These eggs are hers and they're seed corn from the way her life might go forward. And she imagines and imagines and imagines so far forward until all that she has made and then doubled and tripled and everything else running on ahead of her in her dreams causes her to think of herself as a fine lady and uh, being bowed to by a gentleman and she finds her body curtsying and bowing her head in the road and all the eggs fall onto the floor and smash. And there are her dreams from a moment's inattention. It's, it's a parable and just as the parable of the invitation to the wedding feast and, and of Jesus, which is, is uh, prefigured in the verses from Proverbs, all of those stories. But the way in which we see stories, and our, our, our Lord gives us stories, and also anchors them in the stories he knew from the Old Testament, stories of Melchizedek coming out to give Abraham bread and wine, the king of peace and the king of righteousness, wonderful gifts, suddenly appearing from nowhere. And sometimes the gifts of God do. And we, in our prayers, pray for both patience, but also care for one another throughout the world, the welfare of each other in these very dangerous times, as we see those images strongly across the world and the passions of humanity which can go in very different directions and become encouraged in uh, a way that, that are become harmful to one another. Well, let's go on then with our prayers this morning. And we are praying this morning in the Anglican Communion on this 18th morning of the month for the Diocese of Central Ecuador, in the Episcopal Church of the United States, and for Justin, our Archbishop, 
and also for Rose, Bishop of Dover, and Tim, Bishop at Lambeth. We're still praying for the Ospringe area deanery, those areas around the little town of uh, Faversham and uh, Borton under Bleen and all those areas around there and we'll begin to, to name them through. But today we're praying for all those who have chaplaincy work in that area of our diocese for organisations, schools and communities and pray for them and give thanks for their ministry. So let's say our prayer for today, bringing your own prayers and intentions, giving thanks to God for the gift of this new day and for the hours given within it. Here's the collect for this week. O God, you declare your almighty power, most chiefly in showing mercy and pity. Mercifully grant to us such a measure of your grace that we, running the way of your commandments, may receive your gracious promises and be made partakers of your heavenly treasure. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So in whatever language you like to say it, we say the prayer our Saviour taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Moment of silence now as we say our own morning prayers. The peace of God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you, upon those whom you love, and those whom you would pray for, today and always. Amen.